Hello students, welcome to today's class. All of us will agree that illness is not a very welcome part of our lives. But again, there is no way to escape it as well. Day in and day out, you will come across individuals who say that they are feeling tired and ill and they cannot do things the way, the way they used to do it before. Even you will feel happy, healthy and vibrant on one day and on the next day you will feel tired, exhausted and ill. Even though illness is not a very welcome phenomenon, yet it can make for an interesting study. And hence, in today's class, we are going to study what this kind of irritating topic of illness is all about, what is the nature of illness and what are the socio-cultural correlates of illness. Let us begin this class by defining illness. The Dolan's Illustrated Medical Dictionary defines illness as a condition marked by pronounced deviation from the individual's normal healthy state. Thus, when a person is ill, he is unable to carry out his normal day-to-day -day activities, he does not have the expected levels of energy and stamina, and in general, he feels unwell. Now we are coming to an all-important question. Let me ask you this. If you are ill, does it mean that you have a disease? Are illness and disease one and the same thing or are they different concepts? Well, let me answer this for you and this is what researchers say. And the answer is no. Although we may use these terms interchangeably, illness and disease are distinct phenomena. Illness is quite a subjective phenomena. It depends upon our own individual subjective appraisal of our bodily states and the deviations that we perceive therein. Disease, on the other hand, is a very narrow, limited, objective and scientific concept as compared to illness. Let us go to the definition of disease, which will help you understand how objective and scientific it is. According to Stedman's Medical Dictionary, disease may be defined as an interruption, cessation or disorder of body function, systems or organs, a morbid entity characterized usually by at least two of these three criteria. The first is recognized etiologic or causal agents. The second is an identifiable group of signs and symptoms and third is consistent anatomical alterations. So we have three aspects in this definition. A person can be said to have a disease if there are a set pattern of causal criteria, if there are identifiable group of signs and symptoms and further there are consistent alterations in his biological functioning. Thus a person may have an illness but this does not necessarily mean that he has some sort of disease. Thus, a person who is feeling ill may show some form of illness behavior but may not necessarily have a disease. For instance, a student who is used to taking up two or three certificate courses every year in addition to his regular syllabus may not be able to take even a single certificate course this year and hence he may feel that he is tired, exhausted and ill. But again, at the same time, he may not have any signs of diagnosed disease. Similarly, it is also possible that a person has a diagnosed disease and still doesn't feel ill, especially during the initial stages of the disease. For instance, a person who is having a brain tumor may feel perfectly happy, healthy and vigorous, especially in the initial stages, till the tumor becomes big enough to affect his nervous system functioning. Similarly, a person with a cardiac ailment may not show any signs of illness, till the blockage in the heart valves or the damage therein becomes so large that he faces some form of illness. It may also be that individuals experiencing the same form of disease may not experience the same form of illness. For instance, two individuals have undergone the same cardiac surgery. One such person of course follows the necessary medications and regulations but at the same time engages in all sorts of normal activities such as doing overtime office work and even playing a game of cricket. On the other hand, another person who has undergone the same surgery takes a lot of rest, restricts his activity and doesn't move out of the house for a large time.
This is because in spite of the fact that both of them have the same scale of disease, the first person doesn't feel ill whereas the second person feels ill. Thus we can have two important conclusions from this. The first is that feelings of illness may not necessarily involve the presence of a disease. The second is that the presence of a disease may not necessarily involve feelings of illness and this is especially true in the initial stages of disease. Although illness because of its subjective nature is difficult to define, what we must understand is that this feeling of illness or the moment a person feels sick is extremely important because it is this feeling of illness which will actually provoke him to take medical advice and it is this which will actually lead to the diagnosis of disease and increases chances of survival and well-being. The World Health Organization or the WHO in the year 1946 put forward a comprehensive and landmark definition of health. They viewed health as a state of complete physical, mental and emotional well-being and not merely the absence of a disease. The fact that health does not imply a mere absence of disease also means that any feeling of illness in the person, even when it does not amount to disease, necessarily involves an absence of health. Now we will refer to some important models of health that are existent today. There are two major models of health that are used today by researchers. The one is the already existing and dominant biomedical model of health. The other is the recently emerging and recently popular biopsychosocial model of health. The biomedical model of health believes that any kind of illness that an individual experiences can be traced down to its physiological correlates or that it can be explained in terms of some kind of physical abnormality. Although the biomedical approach is an improvement over older approaches such as assigning causes of diseases to demons and supernatural forces, still this biomedical model is extremely narrow and limited in its ability to account for complex and comprehensive phenomena such as health and illness and in fact it is not capable of understanding the reality of illness in individuals. The biopsychosocial model on the other hand is a more broader model. It takes into account the psychological and social phenomena along with biological phenomena that influence an individual's appraisal of his bodily conditions or illness and how he responds to them. For instance, this model takes into consideration the meaning a person attaches to his or her condition of illness, whether the person sees it as something which is acting as an obstacle in achieving his goal, whether he sees it as something which needs to be overcome, or whether he is actually happy about his state of illness. Further, it also sees what an individual consciously or unconsciously wants. Does he want to succeed and overcome the disease? Does he want to fail? Does he want to be cared for? Or does he want to maintain a level of independence while facing the illness? Further, it also analyzes the person's response styles to the illness, whether the person engages in exaggerating his illness experience or whether he does not engage in any such activities and actually minimizes the kind of illness he experiences. Further, it also views the person's current psychological state, whether he is happy, whether he is sad, whether he is anxious, whether he is distressed. It also takes into account familial and sociocultural variables that shape an individual's appraisal of illness, how to recognize it, how to acknowledge it and how to respond to it. Edward Suchman, in his article, Stages of Illness and Medical Care, proposed five stages of illness. On the basis of this researcher's research, as well as other researchers, we can put forward five stages of illness. The first stage of illness is symptom experience. In this stage, the individual for the first time experiences the symptoms and feels that, yes, something is wrong with me. 
Now this symptom experience can have three aspects. The first is the physical aspect. This involves pain, discomfort, uneasiness or a change in physical appearance. The second is the cognitive aspect. How does an individual interpret or evaluate this kind of physical symptom? Does he see it as threatening or does he see it as unimportant? The third is the emotional aspect. It generally involves the fear or anxiety that an individual feels, firstly due to the presence of the symptom and secondly because of how he has interpreted it. The second stage in illness generally involves the assumption of a sick role. The individual accepts the feeling that yes, I am suffering from some kind of illness and he starts showing some form of illness behavior. For instance, he may take rest for a long time, he may avoid daily activities or he may demand more care and attention from others. The third stage involves actual medical care contact when the person actually seeks medical help. This may be to validate the symptoms to know whether the symptoms that he or she is experiencing does it mean some form of disease or illness and if it means some form of disease or illness what are the possible implications and consequences of the same in his or her own life. The fourth stage of illness is the dependent patient role. This is usually after the individual has been diagnosed with some kind of disease and he becomes dependent on the medical practitioner for assistance. Now in certain kinds of severe diseases, there may be an additional stage that is the acute phase between the seeking of medical care and the dependent patient role. The main attention during this acute phase, both of the patient and of the health practitioner will be to increase the patient's chances of survival. For instance, the kind of interventions that we take for someone who has suffered a cardiac attack or a heart attack, especially within the first one hour, can determine to a great extent both his short-term and long-term survival as also well-being. In some other diseases, for instance cancer, short-term survival is in a way guaranteed. But immediate intervention in the form of surgical intervention to remove the cancerous growth and subsequent interventions in the form of chemotherapy or radiation to prevent metastasis or the spread of the cancer to other organs is important if we have to ensure the individual's long-term survival and well-being. Both for serious or minor ailments, thus what is important is a timely diagnosis of the ailment. Secondly, proper interventions taken in a timely manner to control the ailment and its ill effects because only this can ensure long-term and short-term survival and well-being. In fact, the kind of experience that an individual has during this stage of the dependent patient's role, for instance, if he feels a lot of pain, fear, anxiety and discomfort, or whether or not he trusts the physician who is treating him, can determine to a great extent whether or not he continues the treatment for the ailment. The fifth stage in illness is the stage of recovery or rehabilitation. This involves efforts by the individual and those helping him out in this stage towards achieving as normal a possible stage of recovery as is possible in his current conditions. In fact, this process of recovery or rehabilitation can be extremely painful and difficult. For instance, in case of people who have suffered some kind of debility because of the illness which cannot be repaired, for instance, the loss of a limb, the loss of eyesight and so on, this will involve a large amount of adjustments to an entirely changed life situation. Learning to accept the reality, learning to adjust to the reality and learning to use one's own potentialities, whatever is still existing with oneself, for ensuring long-term survival and well-being. In cases of certain illnesses such as cancer, especially patients who are in a terminal stage, recovery or rehabilitation may not mean what we generally take it to be. They face a difficult situation both to understand the emotional consequences they are currently suffering, the pain, discomfort and uneasiness, as also the prospect of death, which is extremely anxiety provoking and scaring for any of us. Although most individuals pass through similar stages of illness, what is most important is that the kind of passage that individuals have differ. While some individuals have a more difficult passage, others have an easier passage. An individual's life themes in terms of the values, beliefs and attitudes that he shares, his past experiences as also the kind of support he enjoys from his family and other socio-cultural contexts can play an important role in determining 
how well he will adjust to the different stages of illness. Now that we have understood what illness is all about and we have also understood the various stages of illness, we will go over to find out the various outcomes of illness, the negative outcomes and the positive outcomes. First let us deal with the negative outcomes because these are mostly predominant. For the patient, illness may mean a host of negative outcomes. This may include a loss of physical as well as emotional autonomy, a loss of independence, threats to self-image, threats to body integrity, a loss of functioning in many areas of the body, an incapacity to continue normal functioning both emotional as well as physical, feelings of helplessness, feelings of worthlessness, at times even strained relationships with loved ones, as also changes in one's normal functioning and lifestyle which may be very difficult to adjust to. For the patient too, a number of negative outcomes exist in the course of illness. For instance, families may need to undergo a lot of task reassignment. They may need to shift their schedules when the, there is a person who is ill in the family. There will be an increased demand of time, an increased need to change routines. People will feel extremely taxed both emotionally and physically. There is a lot of anxiety regarding what will be the diagnosis and what will be the prognosis of the illness because this involves their own loved ones. There can be feelings of loneliness and insecurity, especially if the family has been depending on that person a lot. Also, the families have a burden of explaining this illness to others as well as extended social relations. There is a loss of normal life routines, there is extreme emotional exhaustion and in some cases all this in a combined form can lead to strained relationships even with the patient. Even though we generally do not attach any kind of positive outcomes to illness, the fact is that some positive outcomes too may exist. One is that there can be an increase in harmony and unity within the familial and the social co context as people come together to help the patient out. Similarly, for the patient, there may be an increase in courage, a sense of mastery and control as he tries to deal with this stressful situation and overcome the illness. This would be an opportunity thus for him to realize his inner strength and spirit. Further, in some cases, illness can also provide us an opportunity for a break, a break from a job which is tedious or monotonous or an excuse to shy away from certain responsibilities which one doesn't want to take. However, although positive and negative outcomes do exist, the negative outcomes are far more overbearing both in number as well as quality. One important factor that we must understand as human beings and social animals is that our socio-cultural context influences our life activities in many ways. So it is but natural that the kind of socio-cultural context that we exist in will have a great impact both on our perceptions of health and illness and how we respond to states of health and illness. Now, researchers have found many such associations between socio-cultural contexts and illness. One major association we are going to see today is the relationship between culture and pain which is an important component of illness. Research by Borowski examined the experience of pain among three ethnic groups. The first was Italian Americans, the second Jewish Americans and the third Old Americans or Protestants. They found that while Italian Americans and Jewish Americans were likely to exaggerate their pain experiences and show exaggerated emotional reactions to it, old Americans were not likely to do so. Further, even though Italian and Jewish Americans showed a similar exaggerated display of response to pain, their attitudes towards pain and its implications differed. While Italian Americans were more focused on the immediate consequences of pain, on their occupation or on their families, Jewish Americans were focused on the future orientations regarding the implications of pain. For instance, what their future health and welfare will be 
or what will this illness mean for their families in the future. Similarly, old Americans also tended to be futuristic, but however, they were much more positive. Also, they tended to withdraw from social situations during pain, whereas Italian and Jewish Americans tended to seek a lot of social support when they were in pain. Borowski, in his research, also found out some other important implications. He found that the way in which a pain is viewed and the way in which it is responded to depends upon socio-cultural variables that determine whether or not a pain is normal and accepted or whether it is a clinical condition. For instance, women in Poland tend to believe that labor pains accompanying childbirth are a normal physical condition and hence they are both expected and as well as accepted to this pain. On the other hand, women from the United States of America tend to see labor pains as a clinical condition and hence they often demand analgesics to deal with this pain. Further, we can also see that all cultures are not equally willing to use pain-killing medications. For instance, the Chinese seek to avoid pain-killing medications because they feel that this will reduce the amount of control that they have over their bodies. Similarly, certain cultures feel that pain is something that they deserve, either due to their past life activities or due to the faults they have done in the present life itself. This is a belief that is existent especially among Hindus in the Indian culture. Moreover, Hindus may often feel that if the pain comprises of some kind of terminal illness and if they are going to face death, they want to face death as it is rather than being sedated. Now we come to another aspect that is culture and healthcare seeking. How does the socio-cultural context in which you exist influence how you seek medical care? A substantial amount of research exists that individuals from different socio-cultural contexts differ in how they seek medical care and if at all they seek medical care. For instance, black women, Hispanic women, African Americans, Caribbean Americans, as also South Americans were found to delay the seeking of medical care, especially in cases of breast cancer as compared to white women. Hence, automatically they also had decreased survival rates as compared to white women. Now, there may be several reasons for this. In many social contexts, women are assigned a more differential gender status. They are strictly expected to undergo certain caregiving roles and maintain a proper place in the society. So much of the fear among these women who delayed health care seeking was that a diagnosis or further treatment would impede their chances and their abilities to fulfill these social responsibilities. Further, other factors such as sociocultural knowledge regarding the presence of an illness, regarding what the symptoms mean and what the possible consequences and implications of it may be, as also sociocultural variables that determine the extent of trust placed on standard medical care can be an important factor in determining whether or not a person seeks health care and to what extent and how soon does he do it. Apart from the relationship of culture to pain and healthcare seeking, culture can also have an important impact on doctor-patient relationships, especially in the form of impacting gender relationships within the clinical setting. Research evidence suggests that females from many socio-cultural contexts are reluctant to seek medical care because they fear being examined by a male physician. And even the possibility of such a situation makes them so anxious and apprehensive that they delay the seeking of medical care. On the other hand, if female physicians are available, the seeking of medical care increases. In fact, research found that South Asian women living in North America, even though they had lived there for a couple of years and were conversant with the language, still preferred Chinese folk medicine because it did not involve taking off one's clothes during medical examination. Difficulties in the doctor-patient relationship may also arise if the patient feels that the doctor doesn't understand his typical socio-cultural understanding of the illness. For instance, research by Bhopal revealed that South Asian communities living in North America often preferred going in for folk treatments and traditional therapies rather than standard medical care because they felt that the physician may not have an adequate level of culture sensitivity.
The impact of the socio-cultural context is also seen in the extent to which health communication or persuasion influences the individual and is accepted by the individual. Researchers have found that when health communication or persuasion is put forward in ways that socio-cultural sensibilities, people are more likely to accept it. For instance, health messages that advocate a promotion of health or the achievement or maximization of gain tend to be accepted to a greater level in Euro-American countries. For instance, health messages advocating the intake of medicines or vitamins to promote vigor and vitality. On the other hand, individuals from collectivist cultures are more likely to respond to health messages that adopt a prevention approach. For instance, they are more likely to respond to messages which endorse the intake of medications or vitamins to prevent diseases and disability. Let us go over certain vital aspects that we learned in this lesson. Firstly, we understood the nature of illness and how it differs from disease. We understood that the presence of illness does not necessarily mean disease and neither does disease actually begin with a manifestation of illness. Secondly, we also tried to understand the various stages of illness, starting from the point when the individual first experiences symptoms to the point of rehabilitation and recovery from the illness. Lastly, we understood the socio-cultural context of illness, an important factor which influences the way in which we view health and illness and our responses to it. There is something important that we need to take back from this lesson, especially when studying the socio-cultural context of illness. In most Asian countries, including India, we use a medical model that has been directly adopted from the West. It is just a replication of Western medicine in the Indian context. We must understand that such a mere replication may not suit cultural sensibilities and requirements. Hence, people may feel that this kind of a Western medical model is something alien to us. What we need to do is to take medicine to the people rather than waiting for people to come and seek medical care. What we need to do is to arrange our medical systems in ways that recognize and appreciate the differences in cultural backgrounds that recognize individuals traditional and folk beliefs and help to integrate all these together to provide a model of illness that can be understood as well as accepted by the prospective patient. Mm -hmm.